it's there it's kind of like there are two kinds of meaning and we have lumped them together just because we didn't have a term for this we've just been using meaning to mean well kind of all the information you're expected to have when you speak a language and some of these problems are addressed by bifurcating our ordinary notion of meaning into a couple of things which work a little different All right, welcome everyone to today's MA, where we are very pleased to welcome back uh, Professor Scott Soames. Um, he is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Southern California, and before that, at Princeton University. He specializes in the philosophy of language and also in the history of analytic philosophy. His books include The Philosophy of Language, Beyond Rigidity, Reference and Description, New Thinking About Propositions, The World Philosophy Made, and more. He also has numerous published articles. Uh, feel free to add anything, but uh, with that, welcome Professor Scott Soames. Thank you. All right, so so today I think the plan was that we were gonna have a, a bit of a more in-depth discussion about um, the philosophy of language and uh, propositions and direct reference and, and a bunch of interesting uh, related issues. Um, I'd hoped to have, had read your book, uh, um, Reference and Description, by the time that we were having this discussion. But uh, given I've been quite busy, I've uh, only read the first couple chapters. But I did read that paper uh, that you had sent the other day, and and uh, I'll have oh, a the twenty first century paper. Yeah, yeah, it was called. Um, uh, yeah, Philosophy 21st, in the twenty first century. Yeah, exactly. It's a it's a nice paper. Um, I, there's do th a, a few things that I've I've made notes on that I want to. Um, yeah, talk I just about. got the page proofs for that. I wrote it a few years ago, and uh, these long volumes that are over six hundred pages long, they take a while for everybody to finish. So I just got the the proofs. Oh, so it's going to be part of a part of a big volume. Yeah, Cambridge Handbook of this or that. I don't know. <laughs> All right, sounds good. I'll have to check that out. That. So that's that's probably coming out later this year, or yeah, it's coming out this year. Yeah, the page proofs are you know they look really good. Hardly any uh, corrections. Should just sip through. All right. Um, so I think I think a lot of the debate is going to be. Um, <laughs> And this is something I think you're you're sensitive to. What, what do we really want out of a theory of meaning? What what is that um, supposed to be getting at? Um, mm -hmm. And I, I do worry that um, if <laughs> people have different things in mind, then uh, they'll come to different conclusions, but without some you know real fact of the matter to decide between who's correct. Right? It might just turn out to be. Oh, this person has a theory to describe X or Y, and this person has a theory that's meant to satisfy this role or whatever. Um, but they're not really. <clears throat> they may not be um, right or wrong in, in 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 the sense that one excludes the other. Uh, what do you, and I, and I, there are sort of, especially historically, things that we we have tended to want out of a theory of meaning, but. Um, I don't know, where, where do you think, can you sort of speak briefly about that? I think it's a where we unsolved theoretical question in both theoretical linguistics and in the philosophy of language. I think we've been too casual, all of us, in just thinking off the top of our heads, oh, what should a theory of meaning be? I know what meaning is, so I speak a language. Um, and I think there are fundamental theoretical questions about how uh, the meanings of words and sentences relate to the, inf let's just take declarative sentences, uh, take to the information asserted and otherwise conveyed by uses of those sentences. And how you divide up that picture is something that you can't decide sitting on the couch uh, before you've done a lot of theoretical work. And I suspect we haven't done enough theoretical work to know exactly how to break up um, these different subdomains. 
Yeah, I think I think that's right. Um, I mean, certainly there's some things that we can take as guides in that project, right? And some things we've got to we've got to start with something. So yes, right. we're start with what we have. Um, so I had a so a lot of your work is focused on, uh, especially more recently, um, or, uh, what was that book you have about new thinking and propositions? I guess that's. 2010. Well, so, there's a, that's a co-written book. I also have another one called uh, Rethinking Language, Mind, and Meaning, which I wrote. Right. In my own. Yeah, yeah. But you, yeah, so in in those, and you mentioned that in this in this article as well. Um, that well, we need to take propositions seriously. We need to um, uh, develop a, a better theory of them because perhaps there's things that uh, people think that are incorrect about them. Um, I, I'll say, well, I guess first I'll just ask, can, can you sort of state what your, what you think propositions are? And then I'll start with that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I guess let me, let me put it this way. There's some things I've thought about them, about them, uh, ever since I, started writing in philosophy, and there are other things that I've come to think about them much more recently. The things that I have always thought about them are that they are bearers of truth and falsity, that um, sentences are used to express them, sometimes to assert them, sometimes to perform other speech acts involving them, uh, I think we use that clauses that the earth is round or that London is pretty uh, to designate them. I think they are what we believe, assert, and know. Uh, and I think they're much more complicated than any set of true supporting circumstances that I've ever looked at or thought about. Um, I think they've got to be closely, they've got to have some reasonably close relationship with meanings of sentences, a, a slightly different relationship perhaps uh, for different types of sentences. Um, but, for very many years, for decades, I had no idea what they really were. Um, I knew there was the old Russellian conception of uh, complex structures of objects and properties, which in some of his articles, he seemed to think we can sort of see in the mind's eye, we kind of, it's as if we were passively um, gazing at these inert things, which we entertain, and then we take various attitudes towards the things we entertain. Now, I think, I think Frege had a similar picture, but of course it was developed with his view of senses. Um, and one thing, I, I've never known how to think about the metaphysics of propositions or the the fundamental philosophy of mind and epistemology of propositions. What is it to entertain them? What is it to just um, take an attitude towards them and the, the different kinds of attitudes? These were just words that people like Russell and Frege had used, and they were words that were had fallen out of favor for a great many decades in the 20th century. Uh, and yet I, I felt that the old conceptions of propositions were somehow better than um, the true supporting circumstances, conceptions of propositions. I worked uh, on those for some time. Um, and it finally occurred to me, in part from reading Russell's, uh, I think it's chapter 12, again, for the nth time, on truth and falsity and the problems of philosophy, 
uh, and also the Tractatus that um, the mind, we, there was this problem, the unity of the proposition. And Russell scratched his head about it for 10 years. And um, finally he decided um, there, were, there were no such things as he was thinking about. And what happened in belief was that the mind did the unifying. Well, you know, that led to a theory of, uh, that he had at the time uh, that didn't last for more than a, uh, a couple of years. Uh, but that got me going. And I thought, you know, they've got to be cognitive acts or operations of a certain kind. And then I thought, what, what is this relation of entertaining? And I thought it's performing the act. And um, that opened up something for me. It opened up first how agents who are not self-conscious, rather primitive agents, but still agents who can learn, who can think, who can believe, who can know, I think, uh, they bear relations to propositions that they never have before their mind. How can that be? Well, this theory I developed uh, tried to explain that. And then how is it that we, who are self-conscious, we human beings, can learn about propositions and attribute them to ourselves and others? Um, so I came to feel that we needed a metaphysics of propositions and it needed to, um, we needed it just to explain what role they play in our theory. But then once we had them, if they are cognitive acts or operations, they'll have the identity conditions of cognitive of acts and operations. And acts have very interesting um, identity conditions. And in, in the case of propositions, the acts have the identity conditions that you can have you can have representationally identical propositions that are nevertheless cognitively distinct. And then that plays a role in trying to deal with the many different kinds of Frege puzzles they are. So maybe that's more than you wanted, but that's yeah, no, the that, that, story. That's, that's um, so let me try to understand a little bit because uh, yeah, I, I read that about how you go on a Talk about them as, uh, um, you know, acts or, or, or doings of a certain sort, cognitive doings of a certain sort. Um, yeah. Does it make sense to say that um, what propositions are then? Is it a sort of mental process or a, or a mental process type? Maybe. Yeah, that's what I think. Okay, um, I think this the some plausibility to that view and that um i mean i'm i'm somewhat disposed to not think that uh you know propositions are this independent abstract entity that just exists out there um i mean but building the old, them into like a russell approach yeah exactly yeah yeah it, it just seemed like it was some a sort of realm. mythological story yeah so I mean, I've I've tended to uh, think about proposition talk as 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 another way of of talking about uh, the various cognitive activities of of, of agents, and mm -hmm. it might be kind of useful for describing their their mental states, how they relate to things in the world, and what's yeah. common between agents and and, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I. I I guess I'm somewhat skeptical of the thought that um, a they're the primary bearers of truth. I, I think so. I mean, this is maybe this uh, phrase this as a question. Um, but why I think it's the uh, the proposition that's the primary bearer of truth, mm -hmm. rather than uh, say a person's particular belief, uh, a mental state that they have, perhaps. Or, or oh, is that really not saying something different? Um, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess I start from the idea that um, 
I start from oh. the idea that these states are relational because that's how we talk about them. Uh, I bear you mean some, that the mental states are relational, or the like a belief state, a knowledge state, a state of right. doubting, a state of asserting. Uh, all of these um, have a kind of relational. We talk about them in a kind of relational way. And then we have these names, like we say, what is believed is true. Um, and um, we can say what he doubted indeed should have been doubted because that very thing is false. Um, I mean, this is just a common, this is the way it occurs in our language. We speak this way. And well, uh, that got me kind of going. We don't always speak that way, and different classes of verbs work differently. But um, that kind of got me going. Uh, fair enough. I do think, though, that I'm also concerned of whether, um, on, on that point, whether propositions um, so construed really are, the, in general, the objects of our, our attitudes. Um, I, I seem to think that um, they aren't, in general, uh, the ob objects of our attitudes. I mean, except insofar as we're, in fact, thinking about, uh, you know, particular uh, that clauses or whatever. Um, but generally, we're thinking about things in the world, not not the. Oh, exactly, and that's part of my whole story. That's why I'm so attracted to it, because to believe a proposition, you don't have to think about it. Right. But then, it wouldn't we say that in your mind, what is, your attitude is towards the object, and let's say you're predicating a property? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like that. Those yeah, are yeah. the objects of your attention. That's what you're thinking about. Now, of course, when I say you believe the proposition that Mary denied, uh, then I'm thinking about a proposition. But you know, my dog Lily doesn't do that. Well, but. Yeah, then I'm thinking about the proposition, but we don't have to um, attribute to the person that what they have in mind is the, the, the proposition itself, or what they're well. Know, I do think so. I do think so in that case. Yes, I think when when the belief or assertion that belief someone has or the assertion someone makes is a belief about an agent and a proposition, whether it be. Yeah. Doubting the proposition or asserting the proposition, then they have to think about the agent, and they have to think about the proposition. Yeah, yeah, that's I, I, I'm agreeing to that, but I'm questioning whether what we're attributing to the other agent, right? Um, say when we say that, you know, S believes that P, or, or they have a, uh, we're saying we're thinking about S, and we're thinking about the the proposition. But yeah, but the, they're not. the person might, might need need not. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's exactly what I think, and that's right. one of the reasons I've I I felt when I came onto this, it was such an attractive idea. So, in in what sense then are um, propositions the uh, sort of the the object of our, our attitude? Just in, just in the sense that the attitude verbs are relational, and you know. They relate a pair of things. That's the only sense that I have in mind. Uh, so the pair of things related is the subject in that proposition. Yeah. Okay. I mean, if if that's all we're saying, then and we're not requiring that you know they really have that in mind. Because when I think about no, I really an don't. Attitude, that's something that has we've had for whatever it is, 150 years, and it's wrong. I think you and I are agreeing about that. I think so. I, I, but yeah, I, I think the only point of disagreement there is just a maybe semantic preference in that, uh, well, in that when I think of uh, saying that something's a, uh, we have an attitude about something uh, requires it to be something that we're really thinking about. But I mean, if, okay, if, if, we're, well, not, that, if we're not saying that, then is you know. I'm not saying that, so, right, you know. Right. Then there's really no substantive dispute there, I think. And, you know, we do have, we are at a very early stage, I believe, in linguistic science and right. in mental science. And <laughs> Obviously. 
And I think that we have to develop a vocabulary that gets beyond the old armchair uh, vocabulary. Yeah, so I guess, um, let's see, I had a few more notes written down. Where do I want to go to first? Um, okay, yeah, so uh, in that paper, you bring up a kind of standard example of uh, water and H2O. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's sentence seven or something. Let me find it here. Yeah. Um, I mean, let's, and let's just suppose that this is um, both stating and and, uh, uh, and is, in fact, a true uh, identity claim rather yeah, than a predicate yeah, one because there's something you mentioned. Questions about that, which would be a whole nother thing. But well, yeah, yeah, let's, let's just take that as a given. I mean, you mentioned in reference and description, I think correctly, that it's not really a identity claim or it really shouldn't be interpreted as one maybe and maybe it's a takes the a form of a uh you know as you say like for anything that is uh watered it's also h2o um rather than saying that there's an identity relation but let's just suppose that it is an identity statement. yeah i mean yeah. we could substitute something else. um one thing you say and i'll just uh quoted verbatim, um, mm -hmm. this example may seem problematic since given the widely accepted semantic fact that water and H2 have the same content, uh, one takes the compositionally determined semantic content of seven to be the triviality that K equals K. Yeah. Um, so I'm, yeah. I'm pretty skeptical of the notion that um, uh, our, our concept water and H2O um, have the same semantic content okay. at the very least so i'm like i don't know if, if by water i might mean uh, not to sort of um well you know a clear clear color sort of liquid that's uh, and then maybe i add some indexical or demonstrative you know that fills the lakes oceans rivers whatever something like that um and by h2o i mean something defined you know, chemically, molecularly. Right. Um, but why I think that they, first of all, I guess, what do we mean to say that they have the same content and then, and then why I think- Yeah, that well, they, that is the first question. And, yeah. and this is going to illustrate stuff that we have been alluding to in some of our other remarks. Um, mm -hmm. Let me, let me say that I am, distinguishing meaning from semantic content and not just for indexicals or sentences containing indexicals. I am willing to say that words like water, indeed words like Hesperus and phosphorus, have uh, descriptive elements in their meanings, but not in their semantic contents. And this is uh, because I think there are really two kinds of meaning, as we might put it, that have been conf conflated in a lot of work in philosophy of language and in theoretical linguistics. Okay, so what do I mean by all of that? Um, semantic content is, uh, we, we already know it's relativized to a context, uh, but it's something that makes a constant contribution to all the clauses uh, within which uh, 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 the bearer of that content is contained. It's a kind of compositional, it's something that engages in this compositional process. And, um, but that's not true of 
all the things that come under the heading of meaning. So um, what do I have in mind by that? The meanings of, say, Hesperus and Phosphorus, these are things that when you're in philosophy, you have to drill into yourself uh, <laughs> that Hesperus is for the evening and Phosphorus is for the morning. And if peop people who use these terms uh, would think you didn't understand the meaning of the terms if you mix those up. Uh, and moreover, there's a story, a very simple story of how um, the sentence Hesperus is phosphorus can have a semantic content of, you know, O equals O or Venus equals Venus. And still, because it carries these descriptive elements in its meaning, uh, its assertions of simple sentences containing the term, the terms, uh, contain elements of those meanings and hence are informative. They, are, they become part of what is asserted by assertive utterances of sentences containing them. Right. Even though this descriptive stuff is not in the <laughs> semantic content of the term. And there's also a simple story that can be told of why when you add a necessity operator in front of the two, you you get the claim Hesperus is phosphorus is necessary coming out true, even though the descriptive stuff about it is it, it not essential parts. I mean, it's not true of these things in every possible world. It's a very it's, simple story to tell. And it's, it's not going to be necessary that the terms are co-designative, right? No, God. Even though the, the things yeah. referred is yeah. it's one thing and it's necessarily itself, right? Yeah. And so that's all going to fall out. And um, the same thing happens with water and H2O. Uh, let's take water just to be a single word, uh, a single general term. It stands for a certain kind. We can talk about what kinds, how we perhaps should think of kinds. Uh, but we can tell a story, a good story, I think, of how that kind of gets associated with water. But there's another thing that we've got to say. Water is, think about it in terms of Hesperus and Phosphorus. Um, if you don't know a fair amount about water, like it fills the lakes and rivers, it falls in rain, it's necessary for life, it comes in the form of a clear, uh, tasteless liquid, it can freeze, it can boil. If you don't know that stuff, you don't understand the term. Um, you don't understand, ordinary English speakers, if you knew none of that, they think, you know, this person doesn't understand the meaning of water. And that's what they mean is that you, you bring to a discussion with another English speaker, a set of presuppositions that you know enough about these, the relevant words so that you can communicate widely with people in the normal efficient way. And these are general presuppositions that are associated with words. Words like water have a very rich descriptive meaning. Words like, you know, aluminum or molybdenum or tungsten or things like that don't have a very rich descriptive meaning in the ordinary language of English. So, of course, there are variations in that there are more scientific uses, and in scientific context, then you don't understand the meaning unless you understand more. Uh, so that's how I think that goes. But semantic content isn't like that. Semantic content is just this little bean that gets uh, carried on compositionally into all the clauses uh, that can, you know, contain the term. Right. So when 
so the point is that this various descriptive content um, or descriptive facts, whatever, um, maybe other things we associate with or maybe even are required to understand the term aren't really part of the semantic content. Yes, uh, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's so, exactly what I'm saying. I guess my question is then, what, what is part of the semantic content? What is part of the semantic content, which is going to make the right kind of contribution, both to modal clauses and to attitude clauses and to every other kind of clause uh, that uh, contains the word uh, that has that content. And we don't want to put all this descriptive stuff in because it's going to, because it, it, it makes the attitude clauses come out pretty well, but we can get those to come out well anyway. Uh, and uh, but it's going to make the modal clauses come out badly, and um, so we divide the two. Uh, it's, no, well, it's there. It's kind of like there are two kinds of meaning, and we have lumped them together just because we didn't have a term for this. We've just been using meaning to mean well, kind of all the information you're expected to have when you speak a language. So anyway, that's what I think that's, is going on. And that's why there's been such dispute over direct reference, because it's a very good account of one thing. But and it's it does some good things even in, in the attitudes, but it, it leads to problems. And some of these problems are addressed by bifurcating uh, our ordinary notion of meaning into a couple of things which work a little differently from one another. All right, so I have a, a bunch of follow-up questions. That I think first I wanted to ask, um, is, is there not a way to sort of uh, rescue these um, modal statements even uh, without uh, taking that other notion of, of content? In that some people think so, and uh, but the, I, I want to. There is more than one, I think, rescue proposal, uh, and I think we have to look at them one by one. Well, what so perhaps um, one way to go is to say, look, there's a couple ways to interpret what the uh, modal claim is saying. Um, one would be that, um, a, a sort of like as a a, a, a de dicto reading or a de re reading, right? Um, if we if we want to say that of the term, the fact that they um, uh, denote the same thing is uh, necessary. Well, that's not true. But of the the things referred by those terms, the fact that that thing um, is <laughs> is one thing uh, that is going to be necessary, and I. Dude, I don't not well, sure that's, that you what, need to that's where you, that's there. where you get the direct reference. That's the million referent. Yeah. So you've got the one thing there. But the million term, whether it be H2O or water or Hesperus or phosphorus, can be associated with widespread presuppositions such that when you violate those, when you don't you don't conform to them. You're regarded by your fellow English speakers or your fellow communicants as not understanding the words. Uh, but but my question is why I think why do we need that notion of, of, of direct reference there to, to talk about the thing referred? Oh, because we have these kinds of attitudes. We have beliefs, uh, the constituents of which are things. Well, when you say that. Uh, why do we need them to be the constituents of them? Uh, well, I guess maybe is just, it, yeah, it means we're then. believing something about it. Okay. Right. I mean, and, but, it, not believing, we're not believing something about a Fragian sense. We're believing something about it. We're not well, believing that a certain sense presents an object which is so and so. We're just believing that. The given thing is so and so, right? Uh, but I don't. But I don't see why someone who has Fragian leanings would want to would have to deny that you're thinking about the object. Um, oh no, it's not just that you're thinking about you're predicating something of the object versus predicating of a Fragian sense 
that whatever it determines has the property in question. That's a different right. thing. Um, That's what Fregian so, predication is, always. It's really predicating stuff of senses. Like if I want to predicate P of uh, you, I have to predicate, I have to have a description of you or a sense or something. Mm -hmm. And I have to predicate of it that it determines something which is P. Well, sure. So in a way you're, I mean, indirectly predicating of the thing, uh, of the object that it has. Yeah, that's exactly you're still the word I predicating use. of the thing. Predication. That yeah. Yeah. Um, but so but I think there is such a thing as direct predication as well. And I think uh, it occurs. I think it occurs. You know, not just in language. I think it occurs right now. Um, while I'm sitting here looking at the furniture in my room, I think that in visual perception. We're predicating things of things we see. Yeah, um, but the uh, what what the Fragan is going to say is that you are doing that, but uh, how do I put this? It's it's not. It need not be direct in that way for you to predicate it. Uh, but so I, just in the example with um, Hesperus and Phosphorus. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm. I can predicate something of the evening star. Let's say. Um, yeah. Why does my so predicating require, or is best accounted for by having? Um, look, actually, I, it seems to me that what I can have in mind is uh, what I could mean by the morning star is ah, you know whatever something whatever satisfies this particular. Description. Yeah, of course you can. And, and indeed, I do think that I think we believe singular propositions. I think we predicate things of objects. But I think that we do so in virtue of having a more robust way of picking those things out. And those are also propositions that we believe. In other words, you're believing Hesperus is phosphorus by virtue of, let's say, um, let me just, let me even put it linguistically. Uh, think of a proposition as uh, predicating a relation R between a pair of, between objects, A and B, and um, think of, think of a version of that proposition, and that's, a, that's a cognitive act, making that predication of that pair. Then think of a more complex proposition in which the subacts, certain subacts are performed, uh, must be performed in a certain way. You have to identify A via such and such way, maybe be a, even by using a given name or by seeing it visually or some other way. And you have to identify B in so and so way, maybe a different name, maybe a different um, visual perception. It doesn't matter. And you, maybe you have to identify the relation in a, uh, using a certain term. These are simply subacts that um, determine which relation is being predicated of which things. Now, the representational content of both of those propositions is the same, but they, that is, what things does it represent to be what way? Uh, but the cognitive content of those two things are quite different. And indeed, um, you only believe the bare proposition when you believe some more complex proposition in which you've identified the objects and properties in one way or another. So in general, whenever we're believing 
a bare proposition, we're believing one or more other uh, more enriched propositions, which are uh, representationally identical to it. And sometimes in communication, one of those is what's important. And sometimes in communication, the other is important. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of things to get into there. And I, I don't have that much time right now. So I, I think, uh, so one place to start is, um, I guess I have the concern that that bear proposition, which yeah. is, I take it you, you're talking about the the real semantic content, or you know. that's the semantic content, yes. But right. I mean, call it the real. It's not like semantic content has got to be more important than anything else. It's just, just it's all right. it's just part of the theory. Yeah, uh, right, and. So I, I don't mind, I guess, having a, a theory according to which we talk about that as semantic, like whether we call that the semantic content, uh, maybe there's some reason you seem to argue for calling that the semantic content over the more enriched, um, you know, things believed. Um, I'm not yeah, well, yeah, it's just it's a place to go, lots to go there, but sorry. We can say it's a minimal common denominator. That's what it is. Yeah, um, it's, but I, there's a few concerns that someone might have about including that as part of semantic content. For one, um, it seems to me that there's going to be facts about uh, those kind of that common denominator. Um, I mean, it's not it's not the sort of thing that might be like psychologically relevant to the person. They're, they're not really thinking about it uh, in those terms, at least. I mean, yes, what we can mean? talk about... In which terms are we talking about? Uh, what I, I, I lost the, your train of yeah. thought right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, what we're, we're on a theory of what's going on cognitively, um, what, yeah. and what, they're, um, what things they're talking about and what, what they're predicating of things. Yeah. Um, and yes, yeah, so you can have this sort of bare, if you want to talk about this sort of bare content that, well, what is in fact the thing they're talking about and what is in fact being predicated of it. Yeah. And just a kind of a minimal account of that. And that's what we're going to call a sem semantic content. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I don't mind that so much. It's just that um, I, I think Um, how do I put this? And maybe this is just a preference, but I, I think I would rather associate semantic content with what the person really has in mind rather than some description of what they're in fact doing, if that makes sense. Well, I don't know how much sense that makes, but I, I have a feeling that you're on to something which I do think is important. And it's another, it's the gap between illocutionary content and semantic content. Um, the way I'm setting it up, the semantic content is, is this, as I said, a minimal common denominator. And there's a further aspect of it though. You might think it's always a minimal part of what, of the more robust attitude that is taken um, towards what the sentence is used to express, like the belief, the doubt, the assertion, whatever it might be. And, you know, in my work, I've come to see it's not, it's not always a part. There are plenty of cases in which we assertively utter a sentence which has a given semantic content. In so doing, we are putting more than one proposition into the air. One of them is the bare proposition, but that's not always the proposition that we're, let's say, asserting. Sometimes it's one of the propositions. Sometimes it may be the only proposition, but sometimes it's not any of the propositions that we're asserting, even though 
We're using the sentence with its normal meaning and so on. But there's, there's something about the way in which we get from semantic content and context to what is asserted that is much more complicated than uh, just copying over the semantic content and then may, maybe adding a bell or whistle or two. I don't think it works that way. And you may be thinking, well, that's a complication, that's a worry, and, and that could be a problem. Uh, let me get something straight then. Are you saying that in some cases when you have assertion, we really aren't asserting the, the bare problem? Absolutely. Yes, I am saying that. But I, I just, but doesn't that, wouldn't that lead us to think that that bare proposition really isn't part of the semantic content of that assertion? Under standard ways of thinking about how we cut up these things, it would. But I don't think, I, I think we've got to, um, you know, draw these distinctions differently. And, you know, if we had some concrete stuff before us, which is probably too complicated to do right now, um, we could actually work through some of these things. And I could, uh, you know, we could, we could pursue this in enough detail, you'd get a better idea of what I'm trying to say. All right. I do have more questions on that, but I, since I'm short on time, there's another thing I wanted to uh, bring up from that paper and just uh, go over that quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the, uh, the final section of that paper, I'll just read it verbatim. Um, when you're referencing one of your early works, um, is that New Thinking About What is that 2010 book? Is that New Thinking About Proposition? 2010 is uh, Philosophy of Language. Oh, okay, Philosophy of Language. Okay. You say... Um, in that book, you argue that meaning, M, of S uh, is a set of constraints on what normal uses of S yeah. is or expresses. And then you say, yeah. when S contains demonstratives and dexels or is otherwise semantically incomplete, yes. um, M won't determine a complete proposition and so must be pragmatically completed. Yeah, that's um, part of it. Yeah. Um, I guess I've always had the, th had the idea that... Um, even you know context sensitive expressions, i.e., hey, those containing index, those monsters, and so forth. Um, seen, I, I don't. Why not call those propositions? Why, even if they don't fully. Oh, specify. because they don't contain all the elements needed for propositions. So what is what is missing from them that would be? Well, it, it's different ones. Um, suppose I say no. This is an example. I'm not using this literally. Suppose I say. I'm finished. <laughs> what do I mean? Do I mean, okay, I'm finished with this interview? Do I mean I'm finished with my Coca-Cola? Uh, what do I mean? There is no such thing as being finished uh, as a, um, a truth-bearing element. And you got to look around to figure out what the person is saying. This is a grammatically complete sentence. It's not semantically complete. And you got to look around to figure out what's being said. There's no indexical well, in it. But I'm, I'm not sure. So I think an easier case, can I just take an, an, an indexical as, an, as a simpler case? Right? If I say, um, you know, it's now 4.56 PM. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't think, and that that's going to count as a as a semantically incomplete statement because it contains that. Index. Because it's like the time zone. Sorry. Because of the time zone has been left out. Right. Or the yeah. Um, yeah. I mean. Yeah. That's right. Well. So. What if someone were to come? I, I would probably say something like this. Well, um, why not call that a perfectly good proposition? Um, it sets the truth conditions, um, but well, okay, the world sort of has to supply. What is the proposition? If if it is it true or false? Is it capable of being true or false? Yeah, well, that 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 statement I think would be um, 
true and if the um you know time yeah. zone in which in which i'm in is 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 such oh, that, no no that's but the, you don't know when you you're not always when you speak you're not always talking about a time in the time zone you're in and just like when you say oh at a nearby restaurant that doesn't always mean nearby where you are it could be nearby where i am it could be nearby where we're going to be next month when we've agreed to meet in san diego um yeah at a certain place yeah no it can mean a number of different things and it's 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 and in fact there's infinitely many different things it can mean well there's, uh, but there's going to be those things will be uh follow from sort of unstated uh yeah. assumptions about the right about the statement right um and and but i i sort of have those things in mind when i do right um yeah, you do. I, um, if you don't, then it's not clear that you've asserted any proposition. But when I say, uh, you know, it is now uh, four fifty-eight p.m., and and supposing I have in mind that you know where I am at, in fact, right in, in my present time zone, um, it's still a context-sensitive expression, right? It's still. Oh sure. I, yeah. But so, so what about that is going to be semantically incomplete? Well, I see. I think, I think even indexicals are incomplete. I think he and she and uh, that sort of thing, they're incomplete. Uh, and all we, they just place constraints on what it is that's being said. And it's up to you and the hearers to negotiate whatever it is that's being said. Uh, I mean, see this idea that this we went down a partially wrong path. This great work, Kaplan's work on Dexels, is great work. Mm -hmm. But the idea, what did he want to do? He wanted a logic of indexicals. Right. And he wanted a logic. That means you had to have propositions. You had to have, you know, complete propositions being determined. And the whole business about demonstrations and how they hook up with things, it, it's not really, I don't think it's really needed. I think, I think what's needed is an account of how our words of various different kinds place constraints on the illocutionary content of uses. And there's just a variety of different ways they can do that. What are demonstrations? What are Kaplanian demonstrations? They're not just pointings. They could be, but they're not. They can't be just the pointing. Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, there's something, there has to be something <laughs> intentional. Uh, something in mind there as well right. well yeah it's got to there got to be some way of resolving but that just varies so much from use to use um that i think the best thing to do is simply say we have these constraints and we have various things that are already in the conversation like what questions have we been asking what are we trying what destination are we trying to get to what is already what is assumed what is open and so you put all these things together with the constraints that you're given by the sentence uttered and somehow we need an account of how the audience and the speaker um, combine normally or converge on the right thing and I don't, I don't know that we, I certainly don't have a theory of how that happens. And I suspect the theory that how that happens will be something like a version of game theory in which there are rewards for converging on the right things. But I don't think, I don't think one has been developed. Uh, fair enough. Uh, but I guess in, the, in that case, um, I would just agree that there's going to be other um, things included in the meaning or in the content of what the person expresses um, that aren't that might not be obvious given. Look, they, the that's what we're after. What we're after is the content of what the person expresses, 
Right, but 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 the point is that uh, at the end, of, I still think that, and they're uh, going to get into whatever gets asserted. Of course, they will. Right, right, but but I but my thought is that I'm maybe I'm not exactly sure, but I think you would be disagreeing with this. Is that um, what's going to be included in that content is might still be some context sensitive expression. Wait a minute. Express is the expression going to be part of the content, or is it going to be something which expresses the content? Uh, is expression going to be part of the content? You said you said it's going to include some context sensitive expression. What includes it? The content does, or the sentence you uttered? The content. The content. It'll actually include the word. Well. Um... Yeah, I'm not sure. Like, what are, it might include, yeah, some some indexical term or expression. I'm not sure what. I mean, you're not talking about the sentence now. You're talking about what the sentence is used to assert. It'll include the word. Well, okay, what the sentence is used to assert. I mean, but then there's going to be the illusionary content. If if the if the uh, relevant attitude is assertion. But I guess then, there's, I mean, but when we talk about what it's used to assert, there's, there's an ambiguity between, um, uh, well, the, okay, the particular state of the world uh, that must be the uh, present if, if, if what's said is true. And uh, that's, uh, that's not what we have. In, that's not the content, right? Well, no, not the state of the world, no. Uh, okay. Maybe okay. the time, maybe a time can be part of the content, whatever a time is. But probably yeah. not the word now. Right. So if, if, I guess so we're, we're including in the content um, at least some features of the world then, right? The particular. Yeah, time. that's what I'm thinking. We're including in the content some features of the world. Time is a good. I think the person who's speaking, if the person has used the word I, um, I think that person is part of the content as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I, I guess my concern is that I don't tend to think of uh, those things as, as semantic content. I, I think that's, or maybe, Again, maybe, maybe just the terminology. I'm not, I'm not whether it's part of semantic content or not, I do think these things are, but we're now talking about asserted content. Um, and it, it's, you know, in these cases, time and, and first person, uh, they may be part of both. Yeah, so, so if, if, if asserted content is just, uh, you know, the stuff in the world that's in fact asserted to be the case, Right, um, you know. Like, yeah, I, I'm yeah. thinking of the main thing is like, you know, if I say I will have lunch now, then I am, or let's say I am having lunch now. I'm predicating having lunch right. uh, of me at this particular time T. And so it's like a relational statement and I'm one relata and T is the other. And then there's what's going on relating us because I'm the one who's doing this eating and this is the time I'm doing it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, that's a singular proposition and, and I wouldn't think you'd have any objection to that being a singular yeah. proposition. No, no, and I, I don't have an objection to, you know, calling that the content in some sense of, of uh, the proposition or, or what, we're, what we're saying. Um, I mean, what my objection to uh, is, is calling that part of the meaning or semantic content. Uh, the semantic yeah, content is going to be something no, going on in, in our heads. Stop right? this meaning or semantic content. I don't want to conflate them. I, I'm, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, but it all depends on what we try, what we mean to do with these different elements, right? And um, you know, we we 
this is this is going to be a multi-part machine which ends up making predictions and when most of them come out right we're going to think okay we're, we've done a pretty good job now let me ask you what are we making predictions about if you're willing to even put it that way uh predictions about and what well we, you know, we construct a theory of Syntax, semantics, phonology, and pragmatics. What are we making predictions about? This, I take it it's an empirical theory. It's got to state some facts that we can determine pre-theoretically to be the case. If it gets enough of those right, we think that's probably a pretty good explanation and we should go with this theory. Um, yeah, so I guess there's a... A range of things that we could make predictions about. Um, we're going to want to be making predictions about um, the various cognitive activities of agents, how, how they relate to things in the world, um, um, how they how they're able to communicate with each other, uh, if they in, in in what cases they are and are not able to do so, given their different cognitive states. I mean. I guess there's, I could probably add a few more things, but is that sort of the direction you're going with? Well, it is, but you know, I, I, I was just thinking, you know, think of things that you could do psycholinguistically to ask college students to do. You could build scenarios, have speakers say things in certain scenarios that say, words, you know, utter sentences in certain contexts mm. and in certain conversations. And then you could ask them questions. What did they assert? and then show them a little baby possible world. And was it true? And so on, so on, so on. What did they suggest? What did they imply? Um, that sort of thing. Is, is, and so I'm thinking you make predictions about, uh, you know, um, what is asserted, what is suggested, what is doubted, and so on when people say certain things. And, um, but you don't make predictions about, uh, well, semantic intuitions. You don't ask the college students, what are your semantic intuitions? Because that means nothing. Uh, that's, a, that's a theoretical term. Um, you can ask, what do you mean when you say this? But what does the sentence in the language mean? They don't really have views about that that are very different from what they mean when they say it. And you've got to have a theory that gets the right sort of predictions and but doesn't prejudice the case by importing theoretical terms like meaning, uh, linguistic meaning or semantic meaning into the data. That's no part of the data. Um, the data is the stuff you were talking about, what, what's communicated, what's asserted, um, what was taken for granted, that kind of thing. Uh, and we'll, we'll divide up the pragmatics and semantics when we have robust enough theory to make predictions about these things. I don't think we can say in advance what they have to be. Well, we have things in mind when we say things like, you know, semantic. You have in mind what you mean when you well, speak. Well, okay, but, but are you saying that we should just set those uh, aside and... Uh, no, no, okay. what, you, what, what, you, what you mean, sure, you could say, if I were to say this in this context, this is what I would mean. But that's not the same as what the sentence means in the language. Because sentences, you might mean a variety of, there might be context, you know, things without indexicals in them that communicate different things in different circumstances when used by different speakers. And, but they all seem to be using the same words. They all seem to be understanding them. But the idea that they're all communicating the same thing is surely not right. There's plenty of overlap. Uh, but I think the first thing you should do, if putting aside indexicality, 
uh, the first thing you should do is have some kind of category of some kind of minimal contribution amongst competent speakers, speakers who are judged by their peers to be competent, um, what, um, what the words across all those speakers, a given word, a given name, whatever it might be, contributes to what is said or the, to, to the determination of what is said. Um, that would get us going. But too many philosophers of language say, oh, we have these semantic intuitions. And I can't make any sense of what that is, except they've already decided that they know what meaning is. And um, instead of just what they're using the words to communicate, and I think there's a gap there. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to discuss. And I, I do have follow-up questions, but unfortunately I've, I've stayed longer than I should have, and I, I really have to go. Um, there's others Okay, here well, that's fine. Continue, that but that's enjoyable. That, uh, on, on my half, uh, behalf, thanks thanks so much for, for the right. conversation. It's a lot of interesting things. Okay, sure. uh, uh, yeah, so there is, uh, yeah, you guys can ask me uh, any questions now, I mean, I think, but yeah, there's a couple of others uh, that were asked about the language. I mean, we won't go for too long because you've stayed for an hour, an hour now and we don't want to take too much time, but uh, a couple of more minutes, I hope. Uh, so one of the things is, um, so I can't remember who this was, but they basically want to know, do you believe that the meaning uh, or beliefs be behind words can be opaque to those who utter them? So for example, if someone is uh, genuinely unaware, Hesperus is phosphorus, are yes. they still con sorry? Hello? So yeah, can, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, but you cut out for a minute. Okay, sorry. So do you believe that someone who is unaware that these terms mean the same thing and says Hesperus is not phosphorus, they are contradicting themselves without knowing it? I believe they've said something that is necessarily false, um, but um, that isn't the only proposition they've asserted. They will have asserted other propositions as well, um, but that will be one of them. So do you believe it's a contradiction even if the person did not realize that oh, they course. were the same thing? Of course. Yeah. And could you elaborate on that? Well, uh, uh, you started out with meaning being opaque to a certain extent. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, there are plenty of examples of, you know, not just names, but, you know, ordinary words. Uh, dwelling in abode. Are they synonymous? Doctor and physician, are they synonymous? Um, all sorts of things like this. Now, maybe they are, uh, but you can be a perfectly good speaker of English and think, you know, I'm not sure, maybe physicians are just a certain higher kind of uh, doctor. And you could be unwilling to assert that doctors, all and only doctors are physicians. and you might even say, I suspect that some uh, doctors aren't physicians and what you're suspecting may be something that is necessarily false. You're not protected from this. Um, this occurs in natural language all the time. Yeah, Timber, go ahead. Oh, hi, Dr. Soms. Um, yeah. Scott, would you prefer Scott? Uh, I was just curious. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on the link between having contradictory beliefs and being like practical rationality, uh. or at least being rational. So, I guess like in the case you would say that like let's say somebody believed Superman could fly, but Clark Kent couldn't fly. Is mm -hmm. that a case where the person would be rational? Would you say they're irrational or rational? No, of not. no okay, not irrational. So can you? Um, I might have missed this in your discussion with the Detroit, but can you elaborate on like what do you take it to mean for somebody to be like irrational? Uh, and oh, I, look, I don't have a definition of irrational, but as it relates to the philosophy of language, when you believe these propositions, which 
uh, are individuated in part by the objects which are said to have or lack certain properties, uh, things that you know we can call from a technical point of view bare propositions. You believe them under guises, and the guises are themselves incorporated in other propositions directly related to the one to the bare propositions. Uh, and you you believe the bare propositions because you believe certain propositions under guises, which are themselves propositions. Uh, now, that doesn't change the fact that one of the propositions you believe is necessarily false, even contradictory. But you don't. But the thing that's before your mind is not something in which any uh, contradiction is evident. Uh, sorry, just uh, again, I apologize because I I could didn't I may um I wasn't here in the earlier part. But do, are the guys propositions more like the sense, like what you would say are like the senses of these things? Are those like guys? I propositions? call them million modes of presentation. They okay. do not change what is represented. They right. simply change how you're thinking about what is represented. So unlike so, Fragian senses, uh -huh. they they change what is represented. What's truly represented in a Fragian proposition is that certain sentences determine certain things with certain properties. And objects are never uh, directly represented in a Fragian proposition. Fragian propositions are operations on other uh, senses. Okay, so I so in the case of just uh, the Superman and Clark Kent, would like a guy's proposition be like the person who flies? Uh, oh well, I don't. It might be a. It might be just a visual uh, recognition or perception. It might be the word Superman. But uh, it it might be any number of different things. But if it's simply a description, then that's not giving. And if and and if you're using the name as synonymous with the description, then you're not getting the representation of that particular individual. You're getting a representation of a sense, and you're saying of the sense that it presents somebody who flies. Okay, I see. So if I could just um, re just uh, reiterate, so you, so your concept of like irrationality doesn't require the person at least having irration having contradictory beliefs. Like somebody could it have. Doesn't, it doesn't. You can be. You can have. We all do have mm -hmm. contradictory beliefs, and we're not all irrational. Sure. Okay. Well. Um, Thank you. I appreciate the answer. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Soames. Um, so a couple of more questions that were uh, piling up about the language thing. Um, uh, one of them was, um, you are well known for doing a survey of um, common analytic uh, positions in modern analytic philosophy. How do you think uh, the direct reference theory, Millian theory of references fared? Do you agree with uh, Dr. Chalmers's research that uh, the academics are split 50-50, or what, what does your research say? Uh, I, I think that uh, direct reference is going to be a permanent part of our theories of language, but exactly what role it plays will depend on how the various parts of our language, the semantics, the pragmatics, and the like, end up fitting together. And this project is not far enough along. This, I, I regard it as a straightforward scientific project, is not far enough along for us to be able to say exactly what that role is. I see. Uh, and who was that? Was that Bill or? Me. Yeah, they wanted to know basically, uh, does Saul Kripke, uh, someone you referred to as a good friend, share your conception of causal theory of reference? And uh, if not, oh, what are we doing? Wait a minute. 
did you say the causal theory of reference? I yes. Don't, no. Um, I haven't been talking about. I've been talking about direct reference. Um, I mean, if there was a problem mistaken there. Right? Yes, direct reference theory. Just uh, okay. I guess Saul is the one famous for causal theory, but uh, some people have interpreted him as some million about names. So, what are the differences between words? Saul has, to my knowledge, never accepted or repudiated direct reference. He has never. He 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 is attracted to the million view, but as he says in a puzzle about belief, there are these, what he takes to be problems and paradoxes that it gives rise to. And he thinks it gives, you know, we get the paradoxes, what he tries to show in that paper is that we get the paradoxes without any fancy assumptions from direct reference. They just come from our ordinary um, our ordinary practices of belief ascriptions and interpretation. And you could interpret what he's saying there is, well, our ordinary practices of belief ascriptions and interpretations do seem to be pretty million, uh, but they, they nevertheless give rise to these problems which Saul never took, he, he presented the puzzle about belief as a puzzle, and he never presented to my knowledge any solution to it. Now, I think I understand what was going on there, uh, and I think I can say where he, kind of why he said that and where what was what was ultimately confusing about what he said, but I would not call him a million, but I would sit, certainly not call him a Fragian. He's somebody who was uncertain about what to say about these things. Okay. That's wonderful. So uh, a couple of more, I mean, we'll wrap up in soon. So um, now when it comes to, uh, let's say people who believe, um, that sense is uh, necessary for all kinds of semantic context, the Freudian sense. Um, do you perhaps understand where they're coming from and what they're trying to preserve? And if so, what's your general attitude towards that kind? Do, do you believe that the Freudian response is usually misplaced or coming from a place of confusion? Like, what's your take on that? I think um, I'm not very much of a Freudian, um, but I think the concern with sense is an understandable concern. And I think there are ways of dealing with it. And my own steps in that direction have to do with taking something seriously from Frege. And that is the notion of modes of presentation. But the modes of presentation I present in, in my book uh, rethinking language, mind, and meaning do not change the referential content of a sentence uh, or of a proposition. Um, but there are propositions with modes of presentation in them. They're not Freudian modes. They're a different kind. Uh, and to that extent, I think he was onto something important, but I don't think he conceptualized them in the right way. I see. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Soames, for your time. Uh, it was so enjoyable to hear you today. Um, uh, I hope we didn't bore you, but it was important for us to get to all the depths of these issues and to explore them better. So, no, I, like, I enjoy talking about these things. So thank you so much, Dr. Soames. Um, you know, again, a wonderful handling of all the objections today, and uh, uh, we hope to see you later. Take care. Okay. Happy Easter. Happy Easter, teacher. Bye-bye.